All right. So that's the Jackson. Um, and I like the approach I'm going to show you. It's based on uh, Dr. Hamlin's, the cardiologist notes. Don't worry, I have updated my, my notes. This was a while back. But uh, I like his approach because you can do pretty much everything based on radiograph. You don't have to have ultrasound echo for a systolic heart failure. Now, it's nice to have, especially when you're talking about how severe the systolic failure is, where you can look at ejection fractions and fractional shortening. But you can diagnose and manage a lot of your systolic heart failures just off radiographs, particularly the VD radiograph. All right. Now, he has things that he calls nasty things, things he, he doesn't want to see when he evaluates an animal on therapy. All right. <laughs> he doesn't want the high heart rates. I've said it a million times, diastolic filling. He doesn't want that chronic stretch from the preload. All right, that is having a uh, detrimental effect on contractility, but it's also injuring the myocardium and causing remodeling and scarring and problems with not only inotropy but uh, conduction disrupt uh, disruption. The high heart rate or high respiratory rate is not directly related, but it's an indirect measure that things are not right. The animal is hypercapnic uh, or hyper hypoxic uh, from the heart failure. So the things he's looking for on these is he wants to see a resting heart rate in the animal on therapy of less than 130 beats per minute. And this is your large to medium sized dog. Less well established in your small dogs and, uh, and cats, uh, you'll allow much higher heart rates possibly uh, toward this upper end, even a little higher. Now, he wants uh, <clears throat> this done at home. Uh, you've got excitement when they come into the clinic, so if you had to pick a, a range, he picks 140 to 150 if you're doing the heart rate in the clinic. But he really likes to teach the owners how to take a pulse at home while the dog is snoozing on the couch. All right. Uh, he wants a respiratory rate less than 30, indicating they're not hypoxic, hypercapnic. And he doesn't want the creatinine, serum creatinine, to increase any more than 20% from baseline. And again, that's an indirect measure of pre-renal azotemia, the cardiac output in, impacting the uh, GFR. Now, I said, most of this can be done from radiographs and mostly uh, from VD radiographs. And I am not the person to ask about radiographs. I'm even less the person to ask about ultrasound. <laughs> All right. One of the problems I'll admit to when you work here in a teaching hospital where you have boarded radiologists and ultrasonographers is when I get a case of the heart failure, I send it down to them and they tell me what's wrong with it. I don't have to read the radiograph, so I get a little lazy sometimes and don't keep up. All right, but basically when you're looking at a VD, uh, your, your heart should occupy about two-thirds of the thoracic cavity and there should be equal space between the chest wall and the heart on both sides. <coughs> And you're looking for changes in this. And here are where bulges, enlargements start to occur. All right, one of the first things in mitral valve disease to bulge is the left atria, all right? Now, truthfully, on a VD, you can't see that. It's kind of superimposed over the heart, but you might see a little bit of the left auricle sticking out, a little bulge right here. I'll show you one on the lateral that's really prominent. But that's not always the case. So this will be fairly early. As the disease progresses, you get left ventricular enlargement, okay? So here we're seeing uh, stretching of the ventricle. And the, when the ventricle becomes enlarged, then you're concerned about altered systolic um, capabilities. 
uh, <coughs> you might see right ventricular or right atrial enlargement in some diseases, but more commonly with these two where uh, the, uh, the mitral valve and the dilator we're talking about left. All right. So uh, here we see one, you can see just a little bit of bulging right here. My usual thing when the radiologist says that, I say, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you say so, <laughs> um, you'll be better than I am. Okay. Now this even I could figure out. <laughs> uh, this is not the common scenario. This is rather exaggerated left atrial enlargement. Typically this is uh, early if there's no ventri ventricular enlargement and the signs may be mild. You'll hear a murmur, uh, a cough because the atria is pushing up on the main stem bronchus, uh, <clears throat> these sorts of things maybe some mild exercise intolerance. When that's all we see, we add an ACE inhibitor. Enalapril is what we mostly use. It's approved in dogs uh, once a day, uh, more commonly used twice a day. Okay. Now, one of the controversies is when you get your, your cocker spaniel coming in and you find a heart murmur and you find evidence on radiographs, but he's not clinical. He doesn't have exercise intolerance. He doesn't really call. What do you do? There are two trains of thought. One is put him on an ACE inhibitor anyway, hoping to slow progression of the disease by blunting the range and angiotensin aldosterone system. The other is to, is to just monitor him until clinical signs come along. Surprisingly, the studies that they've looked at have tended toward just monitoring them. They've not seen a necessarily slowing of progression by putting them on an ACE inhibitor early. Having said that, there were some flaws in the studies. Uh, these were done mostly in Cavalier King Charles that have the inherited mitral valve disease, so you've got a breed bias and it was mostly once a day enalapril where we use it more commonly twice a day. So I don't necessarily say right or wrong. It's clinician preference as to what you do. All right. Now, you may or may not see atrial fib occurring. All right. Atrial fib can occur anywhere in the progression of the disease. It often does occur early. When you get this stretched atria, you're damaging the myocytes in the atria and they start firing randomly. So you lose your SA node. And when that happens, we'll add digoxin to it, again, to slow that heart rate. They're not in, in true systolic failure yet. The ventricles are okay, but we're slowing the heart rate. If it's still too high after we get them digitalized, we'll add dilpizin to it, a calcium channel blocker to slow it further. Okay. <coughs> so uh, again, we can't reverse these diseases. Some dogs go years, they, they very little progression. Others go rapidly. You have to assess the individual. But the ones that progress, your, your ventricle is going to start to enlarge, uh, stretch, and you see this silhouette over here. Here is where we add our pemibinin, our inotrope, all right? And if you have ultrasound echo capabilities, uh, you can certainly confirm it with that, looking for shortened ejection, uh, altered ejection fraction or um, 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 sh fractional shortening, okay? Uh, if if we don't use pemimidin, you've got digoxin, okay? But normally pemimidin. So uh, <coughs> hopefully we get them back compensated for a while and they'll rock along. And again, we get worsening of the disease. So here, it's bad enough. We've got our mitral valve allowing blood to go back into the 
atria and into the pulmonary vessels and our left ventricle is not able to pump as well to push it outside the aorta so we get pulmonary edema starting to occur and I don't know if you can appreciate this but here you see some air bronchograms from pulmonary edema this is where we add the furosemide when we start to see pulmonary edema forming historically veterinarians added it early the current thinking is to wait though because when you add the furosemide as I mentioned you're going to sodium deplete them or decrease their sodium at least and that's going to further activate the renin angiotensin system so we tend to wait until we see pulmonary edema before we add the furosemide and they're going to do fine on that yes sorry could you repeat again why you wait to add furosemide when we add furosemide remember it blocks chloride reabsorption at the loop of henley but sodium is going to follow that chloride so we're losing sodium so uh, we lower their serum sodium that lowered serum sodium is going to activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and that is not what we want to occur in a heart failure the, the hyperactivation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is part of our problem that's what we're blocking with the ACE inhibitor so we wait until we absolutely need the furosemide and no longer add it early in the course of the disease and as I said, uh, as things rock along, you may find that the furosemide is not working as well as it once did. Okay, so here we add an additional diuretic. Now mostly we would add spironolactone rather than chlorothiazide. Uh, spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist. So it's another way of inhibiting the renin and angiotensin aldosterone system, the RAS system. And in some studies in humans, it may decrease some of the cardiac muscle remodeling and fibrosis. So we add this. Now remember, furosemide washes out potassium. <coughs> Spironolactone retains potassium. So <coughs> again, you need to keep a close eye on your uh, potassium uh, you don't want them getting low from the furosemide but you don't want them getting hyperkalemic from the uh, spironolactone 